Preface of Poems, Series 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Atkinson. Poems, Series 2, by Emily Dickinson. Preface. The eagerness with which the first volume of Emily Dickinson's poems has been read shows very clearly that all our alleged modern artificiality does not prevent a prompt appreciation of the qualities of directness and simplicity in approaching the greatest themes, life and love and death. That irresistible needle-touch, as one of her best critics has called it, piercing at once the very core of a thought, has found a response as wide and sympathetic as it has been unexpected even to those who knew best her compelling power. This second volume, while open to the same criticism as to form with its predecessor, shows also the same shining beauties. Although Emily Dickinson had been in the habit of sending occasional poems to friends and correspondents, the full extent of her writing was by no means imagined by them. Her friend H. H. must at least have suspected it, for in a letter dated 5th September 1884 she wrote, My dear friend, what portfolios of verses you must have! It is a cruel wrong to your day and generation that you will not give them light. If such a thing should happen as that I should outlive you, I wish you would make me your literary legatee and executor. Surely after you are what is called dead, you will be willing that the poor ghosts you have left behind should be cheered and pleased by your verses, will you not? You ought to be. I do not think we have a right to withhold from the world a word or thought, any more than a deed, which might help a single soul. Truly yours, Helen Jackson. The portfolios were found, shortly after Emily Dickinson's death, by her sister and only surviving housemate. Most of the poems had been carefully copied on sheets of note paper and tied in little fascicules, each of six or eight sheets. While many of them bear evidence of having been thrown off at white heat, still more had received thoughtful revision. There is the frequent addition of rather perplexing footnotes, affording large choice of words and phrases. And in the copies which she sent to friends, Sometimes one form, sometimes another, is found to have been used. Without important exception, her friends have generously placed at the disposal of the editors any poems they had received from her, and these have given the obvious advantage of comparison among several renderings of the same verse. To what further rigorous pruning her verses would have been subjected had she published them herself, we cannot know. They should be regarded in many cases as merely the first strong and suggestive sketches of an artist intended to be embodied at some time in the finished picture. Emily Dickinson appears to have written her first poems in the winter of 1862. In a letter to one of the present editors, the April following, she says, I made no verse but one or two until this winter. The handwriting was at first somewhat like the delicate running Italian hand of our elder gentlewomen, but as she advanced in breadth of thought, it grew bolder and more abrupt, until, in her latest years, each letter stood distinct and separate from its fellows. In most of her poems, particularly the later ones, everything by way of punctuation was discarded, except numerous dashes, and all important words began with capitals. The effect of a page of her more recent manuscript is exceedingly quaint and strong. The facsimile given in the present volume is from one of the earlier transition periods, Although there is nowhere a date, the handwriting makes it possible to arrange the poems with general chronologic accuracy. As a rule, the verses were without titles, but A Country Burial, A Thunderstorm, The Hummingbird, and a few others were named by their author, frequently at the end, sometimes only in the accompanying note, if sent to a friend. The variation of readings, with the fact that she often wrote in pencil and not always clearly, have at times thrown a good deal of responsibility upon her editors. But all interference not absolutely inevitable has been avoided. The very roughness of her rendering is part of herself, and not lightly to be touched, for it seems in many cases that she intentionally avoided the smoother and more usual rhymes. Like Impressionist pictures, or Wagner's rugged music, the very absence of conventional form challenges attention. In Emily Dickinson's exacting hands, the especial intrinsic fitness of a particular order of words might not be sacrificed to anything virtually extrinsic, and her verses all show a strange cadence of inner rhythmical music. Lines are always daringly constructed, and the thought rhyme appears frequently, appealing, indeed, to an unrecognized sense more elusive than hearing. Emily Dickinson scrutinized everything with clear-eyed frankness. Every subject was proper ground for legitimate study, 
even the somber facts of death and burial, and the unknown life beyond. She touches these themes sometimes lightly, sometimes almost humorously, more often with weird and peculiar power, but she is never by any chance frivolous or trivial. And while, as one critic has said, she may exhibit towards God an Emersonian self-possession, it was because she looked upon all life with a candor as unprejudiced as it is rare. She had tried society and the world, and found them lacking. She was not an invalid, and she lived in seclusion from no love disappointment. Her life was the normal blossoming of a nature introspective to a high degree, whose best thought could not exist in pretense. Storm, wind, the wild March sky, sunsets and dawns, the birds and bees, butterflies and flowers of her garden, with a few trusted human friends, were sufficient companionship. The coming of the first robin was a jubilee beyond crowning of monarch or birthday of pope, the first red leaf hurrying through the altered air, an epoch. Immortality was close about her, and while never morbid or melancholy, she lived in its presence. Mabel Loomis Todd Amherst, Massachusetts, August 1891 My nosegays are for captives, dim, long-expectant eyes, fingers denied the plucking, patient till paradise. To such, if they should whisper, of mourning and the moor, they bear no other errand, and I no other prayer. End of Preface Chapter One of Poems Series Two by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One Life. One I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us, don't tell. They'd banish us, you know. How dreary to be somebody, how public like a frog, to tell your name the live long day to an admiring bog. Two. I bring an unaccustomed wine to lips long parching next to mine, and summon them to drink. Crackling with fever they essay, I turn my brimming eyes away, and come next hour to look. The hands still hug the tardy glass, the lips I would have cooled, alas, are so superfluous cold, I would as soon attempt to warm the bosoms where the frost has lain, ages beneath the mould. Some other thirsty there may be, to whom this would have pointed me, had it remained to speak. And so I always bear the cup, if haply mine may be the drop, some pilgrim thirst to slake. If haply any say to me, unto the little, unto me, when I at last awake. 3. The nearest dream recedes, unrealized. The heaven we chase, like the June bee, before the schoolboy invites the race, stoops to an easy clover, dips, evades, teases, deploys, then to the royal clouds lifts his light pinace, heedless of the boy, staring bewildered at the mocking sky. Homesick for steadfast honey, ah, the bee flies not, that brews that rare variety. 4. We play at paste till qualified for pearl, then drop the paste and deem ourself a fool. The shapes, though, were similar, and our new hands learned gem tactics practicing sands. 5. I found the phrase to every thought I ever had but one, and that defies me as a hand did try to chalk the sun. To races nurtured in the dark, how would your own begin? Can blaze be done in cochineal or noon in Mazarin? 6. Hope Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul, and sings the tune without the words, and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept my heart so warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. 7. The White Heat Dare you see a soul at the white heat? Then crouch within the door. Red is the fire's common tint, but when the vivid ore has sated flame's conditions, its quivering substance plays, without a color but the light of unanointed blaze. 
least village boasts its blacksmith whose anvil's even din stands symbol for the finer forge that soundless tugs within refining these impatient ores with hammer and with blaze until the designated light repudiate the forge eight triumphant who never lost are unprepared a coronet to find who never thirsted flagons and cooling tamarind who never climbed the weary league can such a foot explore the purple territories on pizarro's shore how many legions overcome the emperor will say how many colors taken on revolution day how many bullets bearest the royal scar hast thou angels right promoted on this soldier's brow nine the test i can wade grief whole pools of it i'm used to that but the least push of joy breaks up my feet and i tip drunken let no pebble smile twas the new liquor that was all power is only pain stranded through discipline till weights will hang Give balm to giants, and they'll wilt like men. Give Himalaya, they'll carry him. 10. Escape. I never hear the word escape without a quicker blood, a sudden expectation, a flying attitude. I never hear of prisons broad by soldiers battered down, but I tug childish at my bars, only to fail again. 11. Compensation. For each ecstatic instant we must an anguish pay, in keen and quivering ratio, to the ecstasy. For each beloved hour sharp pittances of years, bitter contested farthings, and coffers heaped with tears. 12. The Martyrs Through the straight pass of suffering the martyrs even trod, their feet upon temptation, their faces upon God. A stately shriven company, convulsion playing round, Harmless as streaks of meteor, upon a planet's bound. Their faith the everlasting troth, their expectation fair, The needle to the north degree, weighed so through polar air. 13. A Prayer I meant to have but modest needs, such as content and heaven. Within my income these could lie and life and I keep even. But since the last included both, it would suffice my prayer, but just for one to stipulate, and grace would grant the pair. And so upon this wise I prayed, Great Spirit, give to me a heaven not so large as yours, but large enough for me. A smile suffused Jehovah's face, the cherubim withdrew, grave saints stole out to look at me, and showed their dimples too. I left the place with all my might, my prayer away I threw, the quiet ages picked it up, and judgment twinkled too, that one so honest be extant, as take the tale for true, that whatsoever you shall ask, itself be given you. But I, grown shrewder, scan the skies, with a suspicious air, as children, swindled for the first, all swindlers be, infer. 14. The thought beneath so slight a film is more distinctly seen, as laces just reveal the surge, or mists the Apennine. 15. The soul unto itself is an imperial friend, or the most agonizing spy an enemy could send. Secure against its own, no treason it can fear, itself its sovereign, of itself the soul should stand in awe. 16. Surgeons must be very careful when they take the knife. Underneath their fine incisions stirs the culprit life. 17. The Railway Train I like to see it lap the miles and lick the valleys up and stop to feed itself at tanks and then prodigious step around a pile of mountains and supercilious pier in shanties by the sides of roads and then a quarry pair to fit its sides and crawl between, complaining all the while, in horrid hooting stanza, then chase itself down the hill, and neigh like Boanerges, then punctual as a star, stop, docile and omnipotent, at its own stable door. 18. The Show 
The show is not the show, but they that go. Menagerie to me, my neighbor be. Fair play, both went to see. 19. Delight becomes pictorial when viewed through pain, more fair because impossible that any gain. The mountain at a given distance in amber lies, approached the amber flits a little, and that's the skies. 20. A thought went up my mind today that I have had before, but did not finish some way back, I could not fix the year, nor where it went, nor why it came, the second time to me, nor definitely what it was, have I the art to say. But somewhere in my soul I know I've met the thing before. It just reminded me, t'was all, and came my way no more. 21. Is heaven a physician? They say that he can heal. But medicine posthumous is unavailable. Is heaven an exchequer? They speak of what we owe, but that negotiation I'm not a party to. 22. The Return Though I get home how late, how late, so I get home twill compensate. Better will be the ecstasy that they have done expecting me, when, night descending, dumb and dark, they hear my unexpected knock. Transporting must the moment be, brewed from decades of agony. To think just how the fire will burn, just how long cheated eyes will turn, to wonder what myself will say, and what itself will say to me, beguiles the centuries of way. 23. A poor torn heart, a tattered heart, that sat it down to rest, nor noticed that the ebbing day flowed silver to the west, nor noticed night did soft descend, nor constellation burn, intent upon the vision of latitudes unknown. The angels happening that way, this dusty heart espied, tenderly took it up from toil and carried it to God. There, sandals for the barefoot, there, gathered from the gales, do the blue heavens by the hand lead the wandering sails. 24. Too much. I should have been too glad, I see, too lifted for the scant degree of life's penurious round. My little circuit would have shamed this new circumference have blamed the homelier time behind. I should have been too saved, I see, too rescued, fear too dim to me, that I could spell the prayer I knew so perfect yesterday, that scalding one, Sabachthani, recited fluent here. Earth would have been too much, I see, and heaven not enough for me, I should have had the joy without the fear to justify, the palm without the calvary, so, Saviour, crucify. Defeat wets victory, they say, the wreaths in old Gethsemane endear the shore beyond. Tis beggars banquets best define, tis thirsting vitalizes wine, faith faints to understand. 25. Shipwreck it tossed and tossed, a little brig I knew, Or took by blast, it spun and spun, And groped delirious for morn. It slipped and slipped, as one that drunken stepped, Its white foot tripped, then dropped from sight. Ah, brig, good night, to crew and you, The ocean's heart, too smooth, too blue, to break for you. 26. Victory comes late, and is held low to freezing lips, too wrapped with frost to take it. How sweet it would have tasted, just a drop! Was God so economical? His tables spread too high for us, unless we dine on tiptoe. Crumbs fit such little mouths, cherries suit robins, the eagle's golden breakfast strangles them. God keeps his oath to sparrows, who, of little love, know how to starve. 27. Enough. God gave a loaf to every bird, but just a crumb to me. I dare not eat it, though I starve, my poignant luxury. To own it, touch it, prove the feat, 
that made the pellet mine, too happy in my sparrow chance for ampler coveting. It might be famine all around, I could not miss an ear, such plenty smiles upon my board, my garner shows so fair. I wonder how the rich may feel, an India man, an earl. I deem that I, with but a crumb, am sovereign of them all. 28. Experiment to me is every one I meet. If it contain a kernel, the figure of a nut, presents upon a tree equally plausibly, but meet within its requisite to squirrels and to me. 29. My country's wardrobe. My country need not change her gown, her triple suit as sweet, as when twas cut at Lexington, and first pronounced a fit. Great Britain disapproves the stars, disparagement discreet. There's something in their attitude that taunts her bayonet. 30. Faith is a fine invention for gentlemen who see, but microscopes are prudent in an emergency. 31. Except the heaven had come so near, so seemed to choose my door, the distance would not haunt me so, I had not hoped before. But just to hear the grace depart, I never thought to see, afflicts me with a double loss, tis lost and lost to me. 32. Portraits are to daily faces as an evening west, to a fine pedantic sunshine in a satin vest. 33. The Duel. I took my power in my hand and went against the world. T'was not so much as David had, but I was twice as bold. I aimed my pebble, but myself was all the one that fell. Was it Goliath was too large, or only I too small? 34. A shady friend for torrid days is easier to find than one of higher temperature for frigid hour of mind. The vein a little to the east scares muslin souls away, if broadcloth breasts are firmer than those of organdy. Who is to blame, the weaver? Ah, the bewildering thread, the tapestries of paradise so notelessly are made. 35. The Goal Each life converges to some center, expressed or still, exists in every human nature, a goal, admitted scarcely to itself, it may be, too fair, for credibility's temerity, to dare, adored with caution as a brittle heaven, to reach, were hopeless as the rainbow's raiment, to touch, yet persevered toward, surer for the distance, how high, unto the saint's slow diligence, the sky, ungained it may be by a life's slow venture, but then eternity enables the endeavoring again. 36. Sight Before I got my eye put out, I liked as well to see as other creatures that have eyes and know no other way. But were it told to me today that I might have the sky, for mine I tell you that my heart would split for size of me. The meadows mine, the mountains mine, all forests, stintless stars, as much of noon as I could take between my finite eyes. The motions of the dipping birds, the lightning's jointed road, for mine to look at when I liked, the news would strike me dead. So safer guess with just my soul upon the window pane, where other creatures put their eyes, incautious of the sun. 37. Talk with prudence to a beggar, of Potosi and the mines, reverently to the hungry, of your viands and your wines. Cautious hint to any captive you have passed in franchised feet, anecdotes of error in dungeons have sometimes proved deadly sweet. 38. The Preacher He preached upon breadth till it argued him narrow, the broad are too broad to define, and of truth until it proclaimed him a liar, the truth never flaunted a sign. 
Simplicity fled from his counterfeit presence, as gold the pyrites would shun. What confusion would cover the innocent Jesus to meet so enabled a man? 39. Good night. Which put the candle out? A jealous zephyr, not a doubt. Ah, friend, you little knew, how long at that celestial wick the angels labored diligent, extinguished now for you. It might have been the lighthouse spark, some sailor rowing in the dark, had importuned to see. It might have been the waning lamp that lit the drummer from the camp to purer reveille. 40. When I hoped I feared, since I hoped I dared, everywhere alone as a church remain, spectre cannot harm, serpent cannot charm, he deposes doom who hath suffered him. 41. Deed. A deed knocks first at thought, and then it knocks at will. That is the manufacturing spot, and will at home and well. It then goes out on act, or is entombed so still, that only to the ear of God its doom is audible. 42. Time's Lesson. Mine enemy is growing old, I have at last revenge. The pallet of the hate departs, if any would avenge. Let him be quick, the viand flits, it is a faded meat. Anger as soon as fed is dead, tis starving makes it fat. 43. Remorse Remorse is memory awake, her company's astir, a presence of departed acts at window and at door. It's past set down before the soul, and lighted with a match, perusal to facilitate, of its condensed dispatch. Remorse is cureless, the disease, not even God can heal, for tis his institution, the complement of hell. 44. The Shelter The body grows outside, the more convenient way, that if the spirit like to hide, its temple stands all way. A jar, secure, inviting, it never did betray, the soul that asked its shelter in timid honesty. 45. Undue significance a starving man attaches to food. Far off, he sighs, and therefore hopeless, and therefore good. Partaken, it relieves indeed, but preserves that spices fly. In the receipt, it was the distance, was savory. 46. Heart not so heavy as mine, wending late home, as it passed my window, whistled itself a tune, a careless snatch, a ballad, a ditty of the street, yet to my irritated ear an anodyne so sweet, it was as if a bobolink, sauntering this way, caroled and mused and caroled, then bubbled slow away. It was as if a chirping brook, upon a toilsome way, set bleeding feet to minuets without the knowing why. Tomorrow night will come again, weary perhaps and sore. Ah, bugle by my window, I pray you stroll once more. 47. I many times thought peace had come, when peace was far away, as wrecked men deem they sight the land at center of the sea, and struggle slacker but to prove, as hopelessly as I, how many the fictitious shores before the harbor lie. 48. Unto my books so good to turn, far ends of tired days, it half endears the abstinence, and pain is missed in praise. As flavors cheer retarded guests with banquetings to be, so spices stimulate the time till my small library. It may be wilderness without, far feet of failing men, but holiday excludes the night, and it is bells within. I thank these kinsmen of the shelf, their countenances bland, enamor in perspective, and satisfy obtained. 49. This merit hath the worst, it cannot be again. When fate hath taunted last, and thrown her furthest stone, the maimed may pause and breathe, and glance securely round. The deer invites no longer, 
then it eludes the hound. 50. Hunger I had been hungry all the years, my noon had come to dine. I, trembling, drew the table near, and touched the curious wine. Twas this on tables I had seen, when turning hungry, lone, I looked in windows for the wealth I could not hope to own. I did not know the ample bread, t'was so unlike the crumb, the birds and I had often shared in nature's dining room. The plenty hurt me, t'was so new, myself felt ill and odd, as berry of a mountain bush transplanted to the road. Nor was I hungry, so I found, that hunger was a way of persons outside windows the entering takes away. Fifty one. I gained it so by climbing slow, by catching at the twigs that grow between the bliss and me. It hung so high as well the sky, attempt by strategy. I said I gained it, this was all. Look how I clutch it, lest it fall. And I a pauper go, unfitted by an instant's grace, for the contented beggar's face I wore an hour ago. 52. To learn the transport by the pain, as blind men learn the sun, to die of thirst suspecting that brooks in meadows run, to stay the homesick, homesick feet upon a foreign shore, haunted by native lands the while, and blue beloved air. This is the sovereign anguish, this the signal woe, these are the patient laureates whose voices trained below. Ascend in ceaseless carol, inaudible indeed, to us the duller scholars of the mysterious bard. 53. Returning I years had been from home, and now before the door, I dared not open, lest a face I never saw before, stare vacant into mine, and ask my business there. My business, just a life I left, was such still dwelling there? I fumbled at my nerve, I scanned the windows near, the silence like an ocean rolled and broke against my ear. I laughed a wooden laugh that I could fear a door, who danger and the dead had faced but never quaked before. I fitted to the latch my hand with trembling care, lest back the awful door should spring and leave me standing there. I moved my fingers off as cautiously as glass, and held my ears and like a thief fled gasping from the house. 54. Prayer Prayer is the little implement through which men reach, where presence is denied them, they fling their speech. By means of it in God's ear, if then he hear, this sums the apparatus comprised in prayer. 55. I know that he exists somewhere in silence. He has hid his rare life from our gross eyes. Tis an instant's play, tis a fond ambush, just to make bliss earn her own surprise. But should the play prove piercing earnest, should the glee glaze in death's stiff stare, would not the fun look too expensive, would not the jest have crawled too far? 56. Melodies Unheard Musicians wrestle everywhere, all day among the crowded air, I hear the silver strife, and walking long before the dawn, such transport breaks upon the town, I think it that new life. It is not bird, it has no nest, nor band in brass and scarlet dressed, nor tambourine, nor man, it is not him from pulpit red, the morning stars the treble led, on time's first afternoon. Some say it is the spheres at play, some say that bright majority of vanished dames and men. Some think it service in the place where we with late celestial face, please God, shall ascertain. 52. Called back. Just lost when I was saved. Just felt the world go by. Just girt me for the onset with eternity, when breath blew back, and on the other side I heard recede the disappointed tide. Therefore, as one returned, I feel, 
odd secrets of the line to tell. Some sailor skirting foreign shores, some pale reporter from the awful doors before the seal. Next time to stay, next time the things to see by ear unheard, unscrutinized by eye. Next time to tarry while the ages steal, slow tramp the centuries and the cycles wheel. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Poems, Series two by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two, love. One, choice. Of all the souls that stand create, I have elected one. When sense from spirit files away, and subterfuge is done, when that which is and that which was apart intrinsic stand, and this brief tragedy of flesh is shifted like a sand, when figures show their royal front, and mists are carved away, behold the atom I preferred to all the lists of clay. 2. I have no life but this, to lead it here, nor any death but lest, dispelled from there, nor tie to earth's to come, nor action new, except through this extent the realm of you. 3. Your riches taught me poverty, myself a millionaire, in little wealths as girls could boast, till broad as Buenos Air, you drifted your dominions, a different Peru, and I esteemed all poverty for life's estate with you. Of mines I little know myself, but just the names of gems, the colors of the commonest, and scarce of diadems, so much that did I meet the queen, her glory I should know, but this must be a different wealth, to miss it beggars so. I'm sure tis India all day, to those who look on you, without a stint, without a blame, might I but be the Jew. I'm sure it is Golconda, beyond my power to deem, to have a smile for mine each day, how better than a gem. At least it solaces to know that there exists a gold, although I prove it just in time, its distance to behold. It's far, far treasure to surmise, and estimate the pearl, that slipped my simple fingers through, while just a girl at school. 4. The Contract I gave myself to him, and took himself for pay. The solemn contract of a life was ratified this way. The wealth might disappoint, myself a poorer prove, then this great purchaser suspect, the daily own of love. Depreciate the vision, but till the merchant buy, still fable in the isles of spice, the subtle cargoes lie. At least tis mutual risk, some found it mutual gain, sweet debt of life each night to owe, insolvent every noon. 5. The Letter Going to him, happy letter, tell him, Tell him the page I didn't write, tell him I only said the syntax, and left the verb and the pronoun out. Tell him just how the fingers hurried, how they waited slow, 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 and then you wished you had your eyes in your pages, so you could see what moved them so. Tell him it wasn't a practiced writer, you guessed from the way the sentence toiled, you could hear the bodice tug behind you, as if it held but the might of a child. You almost pitied it, you, it worked so. Tell him, no, you may quibble there, for it would split his heart to know it, and then you and I were silenter. Tell him night finished before we finished, and the old clock kept neighing day, and you got sleepy and begged to be ended. What could it hinder so to say? Tell him just how she sealed you, cautious, but if he asked where you are hid, until tomorrow, happy letter, gesture, coquette, and shake your head. 6. The way I read a letter's this, tis first I lock the door, and push it with my fingers next, for transport it be sure, and then I go the furthest off, to counteract a knock, then draw my little letter forth, and softly pick its lock, then glancing narrow at the wall, and narrow at the floor, for firm conviction of a mouse not exercised before, peruse how infinite I am, to no one that you know, 
and sigh for lack of heaven, but not the heaven the creeds bestow. 7. Wild nights, wild nights, where I with thee, wild nights should be, our luxury. Futile the winds to a heart in port, done with the compass, done with the chart, rowing in Eden, ah, the sea, might I but moor to-night in thee. 8. At Home The night was wide and furnished scant, with but a single star, that often as a cloud it met, blew out itself for fear. The wind pursued the little bush, and drove away the leaves. November left, then clambered up, and fretted in the eaves. No squirrel went abroad, a dog's belated feet, like intermittent plush were heard adown the empty street. To feel if blinds be fast, and closer to the fire, her little rocking chair to draw, and shiver for the poor. The housewife's gentle task, how pleasanter, said she, unto the sofa opposite, the sleep than may, know thee. 9. Possession. Did the harebell lose her girdle to the lover bee? Would the bee the harebell hallow much as formerly? Did the paradise persuaded yield her mote of pearl? Would the Eden be an Eden, or the earl an earl? 10. A charm invests a face, imperfectly beheld. The lady dare not lift her veil, for fear it be dispelled. But peers beyond her mesh, and wishes and denies, lest interview annul a want, that image satisfies. 11. The Lovers The rose did caper on her cheek, her bodice rose and fell, her pretty speech, like drunken men, did stagger pitiful. Her fingers fumbled at her work, her needle would not go. What ailed so smart a little maid, it puzzled me to know. Till opposite I spied a cheek that bore another rose, just opposite another speech that like the drunkard goes, a vest that like the bodice danced to the immortal tune, till those two troubled little clocks ticked softly into one. 12. In lands I never saw, they say, immortal Alps look down, whose bonnets touch the firmament, whose sandals touch the town. Meek, at whose everlasting feet a myriad daisies play. Which, sir, are you, and which am I, upon an August day? 13. The moon is distant from the sea, and yet with amber hands she leads him, docile as a boy, along appointed sands. He never misses a degree, obedient to her eye. He comes just so far toward the town, just so far goes away. O Signor, thine the amber hand, and mine the distant sea, obedient to the last command, thine eyes impose on me. 14. He put the belt around my life, I heard the buckle snap, and turned away imperial, my lifetime folding up, deliberate as a duke would do, a kingdom's title deed, henceforth a dedicated sort, a member of the cloud. Yet not too far to come at call, and do the little toils, that make the circuit of the rest, and deal occasional smiles, to lives that stoop to notice mine, and kindly ask it in, whose invitation knew you not, for whom I must decline? 15. The Lost Jewel I held a jewel in my fingers, and went to sleep. The day was warm, and winds were prosy. I said, Twill keep. I woke and chid my honest fingers, the gem was gone, and now an amethyst remembrance is all I own. 16. What if I say I shall not wait? What if I burst the fleshly gate and pass escaped to thee? What if I file this mortal off, see where it hurt me, that's enough, and wade in liberty? They cannot take us any more, dungeons may call and guns implore, Unmeaning now to me, as laughter was an hour ago, Or laces, or a travelling show, or who died yesterday. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Poems, Series 2, by Emily Dickinson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 3. Nature. 1. Mother Nature. 
Nature, the gentlest mother, impatient of no child, the feeblest or the waywardest, her admonition mild, in forest and the hill, by travellers heard, restraining rampant squirrel or too impetuous bird. How fair her conversation, a summer afternoon, her household, her assembly, and when the sun goes down, her voice among the aisles incites the timid prayer of the minutest cricket, the most unworthy flower. When all the children sleep, she turns as long away as will suffice to light her lamps, then bending from the sky, with infinite affection and infiniter care, her golden finger on her lip wills silence everywhere. 2. Out of the Morning Will there really be a morning? Is there such a thing as day? Could I see it from the mountains if I were as tall as they? Has it feet like water lilies? Has it feathers like a bird? Is it brought from famous countries of which I have never heard? Oh, some scholar, oh, some sailor, oh, some wise man from the skies, please to tell a little pilgrim where the place called morning lies. 3. At half-past three a single bird unto a silent sky, propounded but a single term of cautious melody, at half-past four, experiment had subjugated test, and, lo, her silver principle supplanted all the rest. At half-past seven, element, nor implement, was seen, and place was where the presence was, circumference between. 4. Day's Parlor The day came slow till five o'clock, then sprang before the hills, like hindered rubies or the light, a sudden musket spills. The purple could not keep the east, the sunrise shook from fold, like breadths of topaz packed a night, the lady just unrolled. The happy winds their timbrels took, the birds in docile rows, arranged themselves around their prince, the wind is prince of those. The orchard sparkled like a Jew, how mighty t'was to stay, a guest in this stupendous place, the parlor of the day. 5. The Sun's Wooing The sun just touched the morning, the morning happy thing, supposed that he had come to dwell, and life would be all spring. She felt herself supremer, a raised ethereal thing, henceforth for her what holiday, meanwhile her wheeling king, trailed slow along the orchards, his haughty spangled hems, leaving a new necessity, the want of diadems. The morning fluttered, staggered, felt feebly for her crown, her unanointed forehead, henceforth her only one. 6. The Robin The Robin is the one that interrupts the morn, with hurried few express reports when March is scarcely on. The Robin is the one that overflows the noon, with her cherubic quantity, an April but begun. The robin is the one that, speechless from her nest, submits that home and certainty and sanctity are best. 7. The Butterfly's Day From cocoon forth a butterfly, as lady from her door, emerged a summer afternoon, repairing everywhere, without design that I could trace, except to stray abroad, on miscellaneous enterprise the clovers understood. Her pretty parasol was seen, contracting in a field, where men made hay, then struggling hard with an opposing cloud, where parties, phantom as herself, to nowhere seemed to go, in purposeless circumference, as t'were a tropic show, and notwithstanding bee that worked, and flower that zealous blew, this audience of idleness disdained them from the sky, till sundown crept a steady tide and men that made the hay and afternoon and butterfly extinguished in its sea eight the bluebird before you thought of spring except as a surmise you see god bless his suddenness a fellow in the skies of independent hues a little weather worn inspiriting habiliments of indigo and brown. With specimens of song, as if for you to choose, discretion in the interval, 
with gay delays he goes, to some superior tree without a single leaf, and shouts for joy to nobody but his seraphic self. 9. April. An altered look about the hills, a Tyrian light the village fills, a wider sunrise in the dawn, a deeper twilight on the lawn, a print of a vermilion foot, a purple finger on the slope, a flippant fly upon the pane, a spider at his trade again, an added strut in Chanticleer, a flower expected everywhere, an axe shrill singing in the woods, fern odors on untraveled roads, all this and more I cannot tell, a furtive look you know as well, and Nicodemus' mystery receives its annual reply. 10. THE SLEEPING FLOWERS Whose are the little beds, I asked, which in the valleys lie? Some shook their heads, and others smiled, and no one made reply. Perhaps they did not hear, I said. I will inquire again. Whose are the beds, the tiny beds, so thick upon the plain? Tis Daisy in the shortest, a little farther on, nearest the door to wake the first, little Leontodon. Tis Iris, sir, and Aster, Anemone and Bell, Batshea in the blanket red, and chubby Daffodil. Meanwhile at many cradles her busy foot she plied, humming the quaintest lullaby that ever rocked a child. Hush! Epigea wakens, the crocus stirs her lids, Rodora's cheek is crimson, she's dreaming of the woods. Then, turning from them, reverent, their bedtime tis, she said, the bumblebees will wake them when April woods are red. 11. My Rose Pygmy seraphs gone astray, velvet people from Vevey, bells from some lost summer day, bees, exclusive coterie. Paris could not lay the fold, belted down with emerald. Venice could not show a cheek of a tint so lustrous meek, never such an ambuscade as of briar and leaf displayed for my little damask maid. I had rather wear her grace than an earl's distinguished face. I had rather dwell like her than be Duke of Exeter. Royalty enough for me to subdue the bumblebee. 12. The Oriole's Secret To hear an oriole sing may be a common thing, or only a divine. It is not of the bird who sings the same unheard as unto crowd. The fashion of the ear a tireth that it hear in dun or fair. So whether it be rune or whether it be none is of within. The tune is in the tree, the skeptic showeth me. No, sir, in thee. 13. The Oriole One of the ones that Midas touched who failed to touch us all was that confiding prodigal, the blissful Oriole. So drunk he disavows it with badinage divine, so dazzling we mistake him for an alighting mine. A pleader, a dissembler, an epicure, a thief, becomes an oratorio, an ecstasy in chief. The Jesuit of orchards he cheats as he enchants, of an entire attar for his decamping wants. The splendor of a Burma, the meteor of birds, departing like a pageant of ballads and of bards. I never thought that Jason sought for any golden fleece, but then I am a rural man with thoughts that make for peace. But if there were a Jason, tradition suffer me, behold his lost emolument upon the apple tree. 14. In Shadow I dreaded that first robin so, but he is mastered now, and I am accustomed to him grown, he hurts a little though. I thought if I could only live till that first shout got by, not all pianos in the woods had power to mangle me. I dared not meet the daffodils, for fear their yellow gown would pierce me with a fashion so foreign to my own. I wished the grass would hurry, so when twas time to see, He'd be too tall, the tallest one could stretch to look at me. I could not bear the bees should come, I wished they'd stay away. In those dim countries where they go, what word had they for me? They're here, though, not a creature failed, no blossom stayed away, in gentle deference to me, the queen of Calvary. Each one salutes me as he goes, and I am my childish plumes, lift in bereaved acknowledgment 
of their unthinking drums. 15. The Hummingbird A rout of evanescence with a revolving wheel, a resonance of emerald, a rush of cochineal, and every blossom on the bush adjusts its tumbled head, the male from Tunis, probably, an easy morning's ride. 16. Secrets The skies can't keep their secret. They tell it to the hills. The hills just tell the orchards, and they the daffodils. A bird, by chance, that goes that way, soft overheard the whole. If I should bribe the little bird, who knows but she would tell. I think I won't, however. It's finer not to know. If summer were an axiom, what sorcery had snow? So keep your secret, father. I would not, if I could, know what the sapphire fellows do in your new-fashioned world. Seventeen. Who robbed the woods, the trusting woods, the unsuspecting trees, brought out their burrs and mosses, his fantasy to please? He scanned their trinkets, curious. He grasped, he bore away. What will the solemn hemlock, what will the fir tree say? Eighteen. Two voyagers. Two butterflies went out at noon and waltzed above a stream, then stepped straight through the firmament and rested on a beam, and then together bore away upon a shining sea, though never yet in any port their coming mentioned be. If spoken by the distant bird, if met in ether sea, by frigate or by merchantman, report was not to me. 19. By the Sea I started early, took my dog, and visited the sea. The mermaids in the basement came out to look at me, and frigates in the upper floor extended hempen hands, presuming me to be a mouse aground upon the sands. But no man moved me till the tide went past my simple shoe, and past my apron and my belt, and past my bodice too, and made as he would eat me up, as holy as a dew, upon a dandelion's sleeve, and then I started too. And he, he followed close behind, I felt his silver heel, upon my ankle, then my shoes, would overflow with pearl. Until we met the solid town, no man he seemed to know, and bowing with a mighty look, at me the sea withdrew. 20. Old Fashioned Arcturus is his other name, I'd rather call him Star. It's so unkind of science to go and interfere. I pull a flower from the woods, a monster with a glass, computes the stamens in a breath, and has her in a class. Whereas I took the butterfly aforetime in my hat, he sits erect in cabinets the clover bells forgot. What once was heaven is zenith now, where I proposed to go, when time's brief masquerade was done, is mapped and charted too. What if the poles should frisk about and stand upon their heads? I hope I'm ready for the worst, whatever prank betides. Perhaps the kingdom of heaven's changed. I hope the children there won't be new-fashioned when I come and laugh at me and stare. I hope the father in the skies will lift his little girl, old-fashioned, naughty, everything, over the style of pearl. 21. A Tempest An awful tempest mashed the air. The clouds were gaunt and few. A black, as of a specter's cloak, hid heaven and earth from view. The creatures chuckled on the roofs, and whistled in the air, and shook their fists, and gnashed their teeth, and swung their frenzied hair. The morning lit, the birds arose, the monster's faded eyes, turned slowly to his native coast, and peace was paradise. 22. The Sea And everywhere of silver, with ropes of sand, to keep it from effacing, the track called land. 23. In the Garden A bird came down the walk, he did not know I saw. He bit an angleworm in halves, and ate the fellow raw. And then he drank a dew from a convenient grass, and then hopped sideways to the wall to let a beetle pass. He glanced with rapid eyes that hurried all abroad. They looked like frightened weeds, I thought. He stirred his velvet head. Like one in danger, cautious, I offered him a crumb, and he unrolled his feathers, 
and rode him softer home than oars divide the ocean too silver for a seam or butterflies off banks of noon leap plashless as they swim twenty four the snake a narrow fellow in the grass occasionally rides you may have met him did you not his notice sudden is the grass divides as with a comb a spotted shaft is seen and then it closes at your feet and opens further on he likes a boggy acre a floor too cool for corn yet when a child and barefoot i more than once at morn have passed i thought a whiplash unbraiding in the sun when stooping to secure it it wrinkled and was gone several of nature's people i know and they know me i feel for them a transport of cordiality but never met this fellow attended or alone without a tighter breathing and zero at the bone twenty five the mushroom the mushroom is the elf of plants at evening it is not at morning in a truffled hut it stops upon a spot as if it tarried always and yet its whole career is shorter than a snake's delay and fleeter than a tear tis vegetation's juggler the germ of alibi doth like a bubble antedate and like a bubble high i feel as if the grass were pleased to have it intermit the surreptitious scion of summer circumspect had nature any outcast face could she a son contemn had nature an iscariot that mushroom it is him twenty six the storm there came a wind like a bugle it quivered through the grass and a green chill upon the heat so ominous did pass we barred the windows and the doors as from an emerald ghost the doom's electric moccasin that very instant passed on a strange mob of panting trees and fences fled away and rivers where the houses ran the living looked that day the bell within the steeple wild the flying tidings whirled how much can come and much can go and yet abide the world twenty seven the spider a spider sewed at night without a light upon an arc of white if rough it was of dame or shroud of gnome himself himself in form of immortality his strategy was physiognomy twenty eight i know a place where summer strives with such a practised frost she each year leads her daisies back recording briefly lost but when the south wind stirs the pools and struggles in the lanes her heart misgives her for her vow and she pours soft refrains into the lap of adamant and spices and the dew that stiffens quietly to quartz upon her amber shoe twenty nine the one that could repeat the summer day were greater than itself though he minutest of mankind might be and who could reproduce the sun at period of going down the lingering and the stain i mean when orient has been outgrown and occident becomes unknown his name remain thirty the wind's visit the wind tapped like a tired man and like a host come in i boldly answered entered then my residence within a rapid footless guest to offer whom a chair were as impossible as hand a sofa to the air no bone had he to bind him his speech was like the push of numerous humming-birds at once from a superior bush his countenance a billow his fingers if he pass let go a music as of tunes blown tremulous in glass he visited still flitting then like a timid man Again he tapped, twas fluridly, and I became alone. 31. Nature rarer uses yellow than another hue, Save she all that for sunsets, prodigal of blue. Spending scarlet like a woman, yellow she affords, Only scantly and selectly, like a lover's words. 32. Gossip. 
The leaves, like women, interchange sagacious confidence, somewhat of nods and somewhat of portentous inference. The parties in both cases, enjoining secrecy, inviolable compact to notoriety. 33. Simplicity. How happy is the little stone that rambles in the road alone, and doesn't care about careers, and exigencies never fears, whose coat of elemental brown a passing universe put on, and independent as the sun associates or glows alone, fulfilling absolute decree in casual simplicity. 34. Storm. It sounded as if the streets were running, and then the streets stood still. Eclipse was all we could see at the window, and awe was all we could feel. By and by the boldest stole out of his covert, to see if time was there. Nature was in her burl apron, mixing fresher air. 35. The Rat The rat is the concisest tenant. He pays no rent, repudiates the obligation, on schemes intent. Balking our wit, to sound or circumvent, hate cannot harm a foe so reticent. Neither decree prohibits him, lawful as equilibrium. 36. Frequently the woods are pink, frequently are brown, frequently the hills undress behind my native town. Oft a head is crested, I was wont to see, and as oft a cranny where it used to be. And the earth, they tell me, on its axis turned, wonderful rotation, by but twelve performed. 37. A Thunderstorm The wind begun to rock the grass with threatening tunes and low, he flung a menace at the earth, a menace at the sky. The leaves unhooked themselves from trees, and started all abroad. The dust did scoop itself like hands, and throw away the road. The wagons quickened on the streets, the thunder hurried slow. The lightning showed a yellow beak, and then a livid claw. The birds put up the bars to nests, the cattle fled to barns. There came one drop of giant rain, and then, as if the hands that held the dams had parted hold, the water wrecked the sky, but overlooked my father's house, just quartering a tree. 38. With flowers. South winds jostle them, bumblebees come, hover, hesitate, drink, and are gone. Butterflies pause on their passage cashmere, I, softly plucking, present them here. 39. Sunset Where ships of purple gently toss on seas of daffodil, fantastic sailors mingle, and then the wharf is still. 40. She sweeps with many-colored brooms and leaves the shreds behind, O oh, housewife in the evening west, come back and dust the pond. You dropped a purple raveling in, you dropped an amber thread, and now you've littered all the east with duds of emerald. And still she plies her spotted brooms, and still the aprons fly, till brooms fade softly into stars, and then I come away. 41. Like mighty footlights burned the red at bases of the trees, the far theatricals of day exhibiting to these. T'was universe that did applaud while chiefest of the crowd, enabled by his royal dress, myself distinguished God. 42. Problems. Bring me the sunset in a cup, reckon the morning's flagons up, and say how many do. Tell me how far the morning leaps, tell me what time the weaver sleeps, who spun the breadths of blue. Write me how many notes there be in the new robin's ecstasy, among astonished boughs. How many trips the tortoise makes, how many cups the bee partakes, the debauchee of dews. Also, who laid the rainbow's piers, also, who leads the docile spheres by widths of supple blue, 
whose fingers strike the stalactite, who counts the wampum of the night to see that none is due? Who built this little Alban house and shut the windows down so close my spirit cannot see? Who'll let me out some gala day with implements to fly away, passing pomposity? 43. The Juggler of Day Blazing in gold and quenching in purple, leaping like leopards to the sky, then at the feet of the old horizon, laying her spotted face to die. Stooping as low as the otter's window, touching the roof and tinting the barn, kissing her bonnet to the meadow, and the juggler of day is gone. 44. My Cricket Farther in summer than the birds, pathetic from the grass, a minor nation celebrates its unobtrusive mass. No ordinance is seen, so gradual the grace, a pensive custom it becomes, enlarging loneliness. Antiquest felt at noon, when August burning low, calls forth this spectral canticle, repose to typify. Remit as yet no grace, no furrow on the glow, Yet a druidic difference enhances nature now. 45. As imperceptibly as grief, the summer lapsed away, too imperceptible at last to seem like perfidy. A quietness distilled, as twilight long begun, or nature spending with herself sequestered afternoon. The dusk drew earlier in, the morning foreign shone, a courteous yet harrowing grace as guest who would be gone. And thus, without a wing or service of a keel, our summer made her light escape into the beautiful. 46. It can't be summer. That got through. It's early yet for spring. There's that long town of white to cross before the blackbirds sing. It can't be dying. It's too rouge. The dead shall go in white, so sunset shuts my question down with clasps of chrysolite. 47. Summer's Obsequies The gentian weaves her fringes, the maple's loom is red, my departing blossoms obviate parade. A brief but patient illness, an hour to prepare, and one below this morning is where the angels are. It was a short procession. The bobolink was there. An aged bee addressed us, and then we knelt in prayer. We trust that she was willing. We ask that we may be. Summer, sister, seraph, let us go with thee. In the name of the bee, and of the butterfly, and of the breeze, amen. 48. Fringed Gentian God made a little gentian, it tried to be a rose, and failed, and all the summer laughed, but just before the snows, there came a purple creature that ravished all the hill, and summer hid her forehead, and mockery was still. The frosts were her condition, the Tyrian would not come, until the north evoked it. Creator, shall I bloom? 49. November Besides the autumn poets sing a few prosaic days, a little this side of the snow and that side of the haze, a few incisive mornings, a few ascetic eyes, gone Mr. Bryant's goldenrod and Mr. Thompson's sheaves. Still is the bustle in the brook, sealed are the spicy valves, mesmeric fingers softly touch the eyes of many elves. Perhaps a squirrel may remain, my sentiments to share, Grant me, O Lord, a sunny mind, thy windy will to bear. 50. The Snow It sifts from leaden sieves, it powders all the wood, it fills with alabaster wool the wrinkles of the road. It makes an even face of mountain and of plain, unbroken forehead from the east unto the east again. It reaches to the fence, it wraps it rail by rail, till it is lost in fleeces, it flings a crystal veil. On stump and stack and stem, the summer's empty room, 
acres of seams where harvests were, recordless but for them. It ruffles wrists of poets as ankles of a queen, then stills its artisans like ghosts, denying they have been. Fifty one. The Blue Jay. No brigadier throughout the year so civic as the jay, a neighbor and a warrior too, with shrill felicity, pursuing winds that censure us a February day, the brother of the universe was never blown away. The snow and he are intimate, I've often seen them play, when heaven looked upon us all with such severity, I felt apology were due to an insulted sky whose pompous frown was nutriment to their temerity. The pillow of this daring head is pungent evergreens, his larder terse and militant, unknown, refreshing things, his character a tonic, his future a dispute, unfair an immortality that leaves this neighbor out. 3 Chapter 4 of Poems Series 2 by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 4. Time and Eternity. 1. Let down the bars, O death, the tired flocks come in, whose bleeding ceases to repeat, whose wandering is done. Thine is the stillest night, thine the securest fold. Too near thou art for seeking thee, too tender to be told. 2. Going to heaven. I don't know when, pray do not ask me how. Indeed, I'm too astonished to think of answering you. Going to heaven, how dim it sounds, and yet it will be done, as sure as flocks go home at night unto the shepherd's arm. Perhaps you're going too, who knows, if you should get there first. Save just a little place for me, close to the two I lost. The smallest robe will fit me, and just a bit of crown, for you know we do not mind our dress when we are going home. I'm glad I don't believe it, for it would stop my breath, and I'd like to look a little more at such a curious earth. I'm glad they did believe it, whom I have never found, since the mighty autumn afternoon I left them in the ground. 3. At least to pray is left, is left, O Jesus, in the air. I know not which thy chamber is, I'm knocking everywhere. Thou stirrest earthquake in the south, and maelstrom in the sea. Say, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, hast thou no arm for me? 4. Epitaph Step lightly on this narrow spot, the broadest land that grows, is not so ample as the breast these emerald seams enclose. Step lofty, for this name is told, as far as canon dwell, or flag subsist, or fame export, her deathless syllable. 5. Morns like these we parted, noons like these she rose, fluttering first, then firmer, to her fair repose. Never did she lisp it, and twas not for me. She was mute from transport, I from agony. Till the evening, nearing, one the shutters drew. Quick, a sharper rustling, and this linnet flew. Six. A death blow is a life blow to some, who, till they died, did not alive become. Who, had they lived, had died, but when they died. Vitality begun. 7. I read my sentence steadily, reviewed it with my eyes, to see that I made no mistake in its extremest clause, the date and manner of the shame, and then the pious form, that God have mercy on the soul, the jury voted him. I made my soul familiar with her extremity, that at the last it should not be a novel agony, but she and death, acquainted, meet tranquilly as friends, 
salute and pass without a hint, and there the matter ends. Eight. I have not told my garden yet, lest that should conquer me. I have not quite the strength now to break it to the bee. I will not name it in the street, for shops would stare, that I, so shy, so very ignorant, should have the face to die. The hillsides must not know it, where I have rambled so, nor tell the loving forests the day that I shall go, nor lisp it at the table, nor heedless by the way, hint that within the riddle one will walk to-day. Nine. The Battlefield They dropped like flakes, they dropped like stars, like petals from a rose, when suddenly across the June a wind with fingers goes. They perished in the seamless grass, no eye could find the place, but God on his repealless list can summon every face. Ten. The only ghost I ever saw was dressed in Mechlin so. He wore no sandal on his foot and stepped like flakes of snow. His gait was soundless like the bird, but rapid like the roe. His fashions quaint mosaic, or haply mistletoe. His conversation seldom, his laughter like the breeze, that dies away in dimples among the pensive trees. Our interview was transient, of me himself was shy, and God forbid I look behind since that appalling day. 11. Some too fragile for winter winds the thoughtful grave encloses, tenderly tucking them in from frost before their feet are cold. Never the treasures in her nest the cautious grave exposes, building where schoolboy dare not look and sportsman is not bold. This covert have all the children, early aged and often cold, sparrows unnoticed by the father, lambs for whom time had not a fold. Twelve. As by the dead we love to sit, become so wondrous dear, as for the lost we grapple, though all the rest are here. In broken mathematics we estimate our prize, vast in its fading ratio, to our penurious eyes. 13. Memorials Death sets a thing significant the eye had hurried by, accept a perished creature and treat us tenderly, to ponder little workmanships in crayon or in wool, with this was last her fingers did, industrious until, the thimble weighed too heavy, the stitches stopped themselves, and then twas put among the dust upon the closet shelves. A book I have a friend gave, whose pencil here and there had notched the place that pleased him, at rest his fingers are. Now when I read, I read not, for interrupting tears, obliterate the etchings, too costly for repairs. 14. I went to heaven, twas a small town, lit with a ruby, lathed with down, stiller than the fields, at the full dew, beautiful as pictures, no man drew. People like the moth, of Mechlin frames, duties of gossamer, and eider names, almost contented I could be, among such unique society. 15. Their height in heaven comforts not, their glory not to me. T'was best imperfect as it was, I'm finite, I can't see. The house of supposition, the glimmering frontier, that skirts the acres of perhaps, to me shows insecure. The wealth I had contented me, if t'were a meaner size, then I had counted it until it pleased my narrow eyes. Better than larger values, however true their show, this timid life of evidence keeps pleading, I don't know. 16. There is a shame of nobleness, confronting sudden pelf, a finer shame of ecstasy, convicted of itself. 
a best disgrace a brave man feels acknowledged of the brave one more ye blessed to be told but this involves the grave seventeen triumph triumph may be of several kinds there's triumph in the room when that old imperator death by faith is overcome there's triumph of the finer mind when truth affronted long advances calm to her supreme her god her only throng a triumph when temptation's bribe is slowly handed back one eye upon the heaven renounced and one upon the rack severer triumph by himself experienced who can pass acquitted from that naked bar jehovah's countenance eighteen pompless no life can pass away the lowliest career to the same pageant wends its way as that exalted here how cordial is the misery the hospitable pall of this way beckons spaciously a miracle for all nineteen i noticed people disappeared when but a little child supposed they visited remote or settled regions wild now know I they both visited and settled regions wild, but did because they died, a fact withheld the little child. 20. Following. I had no cause to be awake, my best was gone to sleep, and morn a new politeness took, and failed to wake them up, but called the others clear, and passed their curtains by. Sweet morning, when I oversleep, knock, recollect for me. I looked at sunrise once, and then I looked at them, and wishfulness in me arose for circumstance the same. Twas such an ample peace, it could not hold a sigh. Twas Sabbath with the bells divorced, twas sunset all the day. So choosing but a gown, and taking but a prayer, the only raiment I should need, I struggled and was there. 21. If anybody's friend be dead, its sharpest of the theme, the thinking how they walked alive at such and such a time. Their costume of a Sunday, some manner of the hair, a prank nobody knew but them, lost in the sepulchre. How warm they were on such a day, you almost feel the date, so short way off it seems, and now they're centuries from that. How pleased they were at what you said, you try to touch the smile, and dip your fingers in the frost. When was it, can you tell? You asked the company to tea, acquaintance just a few, and chatted close with this grand thing. That don't remember you? Past bows and invitations, past interview and vow, past what ourselves can estimate, that makes the quick of woe. 22. The Journey Our journey had advanced, our feet were almost come, to that odd fork in being's road, eternity by term our pace took sudden awe our feet reluctant led before were cities but between the forest of the dead retreat was out of hope behind a sealed rout eternity's white flag before and god at every gate twenty three a country burial ample make this bed make this bed with awe in it wait till judgment break, excellent and fair. Be its mattress straight, be its pillow round. Let no sunrise's yellow noise interrupt this ground. 24. Going. On such a night or such a night, would anybody care if such a little figure slipped quiet from its chair? So quiet, oh how quiet, that nobody might know but that the little figure rocked softer to and fro? On such a dawn, or such a dawn, would anybody sigh, that such a little figure too sound asleep did lie? For Chanticleer to wake it, or stirring house below, or giddy bird in orchard, or early task to do? There was a little figure plump for every little knoll, busy needles and spools of thread, and trudging feet from school. Playmates and holidays and nuts and visions vast and small. Strange that the feet so precious charged should reach so small a goal. 25. Essential oils are wrung, the attar from the rose. 
is not expressed by sons alone, it is the gift of screws. The general rose decays, but this in lady's drawer makes summer when the lady lies in ceaseless rosemary. 26. I lived on dread to those who know the stimulus there is, in danger other impetus is numb and vitalless. As twere a spur upon the soul, a fear will urge it where, to go without the spectre's aid were challenging despair. 27. If I should die, and you should live, and time should gurgle on, and morn should beam, and noon should burn, as it has usual done, if birds should build as early, and bees as bustling go, one might depart at option from enterprise below. Tis sweet to know that stocks will stand, when we with daisies lie, that commerce will continue, and trades as briskly fly. It makes the parting tranquil, and keeps the soul serene, that gentlemen so sprightly conduct the pleasing scene. 28. At length. Her final summer was it, and yet we guessed it not. If tenderer industriousness pervaded her, we thought, a further force of life developed from within, when death lit all the shortness up, and made the hurry plain. We wondered at our blindness, when nothing was to see, but her Carrara guidepost at our stupidity. When duller than our dullness, the busy darling lay, so busy was she finishing, so leisurely were we. 29. Ghosts. One need not be a chamber to be haunted, one need not be a house. The brain has corridors surpassing material place. Far safer of a midnight meeting, external ghost, than an interior confronting that whiter host. Far safer through an abbey gallop, the stones a chase, than moonless one's own self encounter in lonesome place. Our self behind our self concealed should startle most. Assassin hid in our apartment be horrors least. The prudent carries a revolver, he bolts the door, or looking a superior spectre, more near. 30. Vanished. She died, this was the way she died, and when her breath was done, took up her simple wardrobe and started for the sun. Her little figure at the gate the angels must have spied, since I could never find her upon the mortal side. 31. Precedence. Wait till the majesty of death invests so mean a brow. Almost a powdered footman might dare to touch it now. Wait till in everlasting robes this democrat is dressed, then prate about preferment and station and the rest. Around this quiet courtier obsequious angels wait, Full royal is his retinue, full purple is his state. A lord might dare to lift the hat to such a modest clay, since that my lord, the lord of lords, receives unblushingly. 32. Gone. Went up a year this evening, I recollect it well. Amid no bells nor bravos, the bystanders will tell. Cheerful as to the village, tranquil as to repose, Chastened as to the chapel, this humble tourist rose. Did not talk of returning, alluded to no time, when, were the gales propitious, we might look for him. Was grateful for the roses, in life's diverse bouquet, talked softly of new species, to pick another day. Beguiling thus the wonder, the wondrous nearer drew, hands bustled at the moorings, the crowd respectful grew, ascended from our vision to countenances new, a difference, a daisy, is all the rest I knew. 33. Requiem. Taken from men this morning, carried by men today, met by the gods with banners who marshaled her away. One little maid from playmates, one little mind from school. There must be guests in Eden, all the rooms are full. Far as the east from even, dim as the border star, Courtiers quaint in kingdoms are departed are. 
34. What inn is this, where, for the night, peculiar traveller comes? Who is the landlord, where the maids? Behold, what curious rooms! No ruddy fires on the hearth, no brimming tankards flow. Necromancer, landlord, who are these below? 35. It was not death, for I stood up, and all the dead lie down. It was not night, for all the bells put out their tongues for noon. It was not frost, for on my flesh I felt Sirocco's crawl, nor fire, for just my marble feet could keep a chancel cool. And yet it tasted like them all, the figures I have seen, set orderly for burial, reminded me of mine, as if my life were shaven and fitted to a frame, and could not breathe without a key, and twas like midnight some, when everything that ticked has stopped, and space stares all around, or grisly frost's first autumn morns repeal the beating ground, but most like chaos, stopless, cool, without a chance or spar, or even a report of land to justify despair. 36. Till the End I should not dare to leave my friend, because, if he should die, while I was gone, and I, too late, should reach the heart that wanted me, if I should disappoint the eyes that hunted, hunted so to see, and could not bear to shut until they noticed me, they noticed me, if I should stab the patient faith, so sure I'd come, so sure I'd come, it listening, listening, went to sleep, telling my tardy name. My heart would wish it broke before, since breaking then, since breaking then, were useless as next morning's sun, where midnight frosts had lain. 37. Void. Great streets of silence led away to neighborhoods of pause. Here was no notice, no dissent, no universe, no laws. By clocks t'was morning, and for night the bells at distance called, but epoch had no basis here, for period exhaled. 38. A throw upon the features, a hurry in the breath, an ecstasy of parting, denominated death, an anguish at the mention, which, when to patience grown, I've known permission given to rejoin its own. Thirty nine. Saved. Of tribulation these are they, denoted by the white. The spangled gowns a lesser rank of victors designate. All these did conquer but the ones who overcame most times, where nothing commoner than snow, no ornament but palms. Surrender is a sort unknown on this superior soil. Defeat an outgrown anguish, remembered as the mile. Our panting ankle barely gained, when night devoured the road, but we stood whispering in the house, and all we said was saved. 40. I think just how my shape will rise, when I shall be forgiven, till hair and eyes and timid head are out of sight in heaven. I think just how my lips will weigh, with shapeless quivering prayer, that you so late consider me the sparrow of your care. I mind me that of anguish sent, some drifts were moved away, before my simple bosom broke, and why not this, if they? And so, until delirious born, I con that thing forgiven, till with long fright and longer trust I drop my heart unshriven. 41. THE FORGOTTEN GRAVE After a hundred years, nobody knows the place, agony that enacted there, motionless as peace. Weeds triumphant ranged, strangers strolled and spelled, at the lone orthography of the elder dead. Winds of summer fields recollect the way, instinct picking up the key, dropped by memory. 42. Lay this laurel on the one, too intrinsic for renown. Laurel, veil your deathless tree, him you chasten, that is he. 
End of chapter 4 Recording by Laura Atkinson End of Poems Series 2 by Emily Dickinson